So the title of the course uh, is The Science of Everyday Thinking. And uh, what we're doing here is, is looking at some of the claims that people make about immunization and, and vaccinations. And I just want to start off by doing a bit of myth busting on a few of the common immunization myths. For example, um, is there any evidence whatsoever that heavy metals in, uh, in vaccines cause any sort of difficulties? Is, is mercury a problem these days? Vaccines nowadays, at least in the developed world, do not have mercury in them anymore. It was taken out not because there was evidence that there was a problem, but because people were concerned that there might be without any evidence. The reality is that the small, very small amount of mercury that's present inside the vaccine material that's given in a routine vaccination is far less than you'd actually consume in the course of a normal diet. Right. And uh, another common one is that um, newborns or, or small children are overloaded somehow. Their immune system can't handle uh, all of these vaccinations. Is well, the reality, of course, is that it handles all the infections that the vaccines are designed to prevent, and the vaccines are much less of a challenge to the immune system than the infections would be, and yet we still survive all the infections as well. Mm -hmm. So the reality is that your immune system is very adaptable, and it's also very selective. It only makes an immune response to what you give it to do at the time. So it's not as if you're wearing it out by using up all the capacity because the capacity for everything else still exists even after you've dealt with whatever virus or vaccine you've just had. Mm -hmm. And um, some people think that uh, vaccines have long-term side effects that we just can't see yet. Uh, and so they're being slightly risk averse to try to yeah, they don't want to tempt fate or something for something that could happen in 30 years if it hasn't been tested appropriately. Is there anything to that? Well, that's the most difficult one to prove or disprove, of course, because uh, the frequency with which people get rare diseases is low and everybody gets vaccinated or nearly everybody. And therefore, you don't really have a comparison group to say definitely these things are not due to vaccination. Having said that, the diseases that we recognize are no more common now than they were before routine vaccinations were introduced. Uh, some of them become commoner because we're li living longer now because we don't get the infections anymore, but there's no direct evidence that any particular disease has been attributable to vaccines, with one or two minor exceptions. I mean, some vaccines that were made in great haste to deal with infections, such as the swine flu vaccine, definitely cause rare autoimmune disease. It was only increased about twofold over what you would have expected to see, but it was definitely increased. That vaccine was never needed and isn't used anymore. But for the vast majority of vaccines, we've got so much data now to say that there's no evidence that these vaccines increase your risk of getting disease. And I assume then that the myth of um, vaccines or immunization causes autism is obviously incorrect? Well, that has been dismissed thoroughly now. And of course, the person who first raised that spectre has been shown to be present his data fraudulently to achieve an effect. And the total data set has been discredited. Wow. Uh, the, the last one, I think, is <laughs> quite interesting. Kind of is driven a little bit by what we've been talking about, the anti-establishment bias. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be that uh, the pharmaceutical companies are driving the, the vaccine enterprise. And uh, if they develop a vaccine, then everyone has to take it, and therefore profits roll their way. Well, the, the statement that you've made is true. A vaccine company exists to make vaccines and because they are pro owned by shareholders, they are expected to turn a profit. But the cost of developing these vaccines is extraordinarily high and the risk is extraordinarily high too because the vast majority of vaccines that are proposed never get out there to the market. So vaccine companies actually got to the stage where they were pretty well turning around saying that we're not going to make vaccines anymore, we can't make any money off these. And it was only when the American government stepped in and said, look, we will indemnify the vaccine companies against any potential claims for problems from the vaccine, that the vaccine companies were really able to carry on making vaccines. Hmm. Vaccine companies actually started as philanthropic organisations, by and large, Commonwealth Serum Laboratories was a government organisation makes vaccines in Australia. Uh, the Burroughs Wellcome was actually found, founded by Henry Wellcome as a philanthropic organisation and eventually became the Wellcome Trust. And the money that was made out of the vaccines is given back to research. Right. So are there any risks then with vaccines? Oh, sure. Every intervention that you do, there is a potential risk. Most vaccines are very, very safe. 
are one in a million allergic reactions. Uh, that's about the same for almost all the vaccines that we currently give out. And that risk is obviously far less than the risk that would be associated with the infection that the vaccine is designed to prevent. Most people get a sore arm when they get a shot, and that's a, that's a risk that you take, but it's a pretty trivial outcome. And some people feel a bit flu-like. But in terms of long-term risks, the only clearly identified one is that you can get an allergic reaction when you get the vaccine. And some of these are severe, but about one in a million people that get a vaccine get an allergic reaction. Mm -hmm. Now, can you give us uh, a bit of an indication of what this looks like? I mean, when, when a vaccine is being tested, uh, we've, we've talked a bit in the course about the experimental method, uh, about placebos and experimental groups and the difference between them. How does it work with such a large sort of intervention like, like a vaccine before it goes out to market? What, what needs to be done? Well, the vaccines always go through a fairly similar sort of testing process. First of all, you demonstrate if there is an animal model that the vaccine will protect the inf against the infection in an animal. Mm -hmm. uh, if there isn't an animal model of the infection, then you at least test that the right sort of immune response is made in the animal to actually predict that it will protect a human. Then you do dose ranging studies in a small number of healthy volunteers to see how much of the vaccine you need to give to give an immune response that you think will be protective. And then you go on to do studies which become increasingly more broad spread. Initially, they start focusing on the ideal target group and you basically compare vaccine with a placebo and find out whether the vaccine protects. You, of course, have to wait until enough people are naturally infected in the placebo group before you get an answer, which is why you need big trials. And then eventually you go out and take all comers and immunize everybody that you would plan to immunize, including people who might have had the infection already, people who have recently been ill with other illnesses, and basically try and get as broad a picture as possible of how protective the vaccine is vis-a-vis -vis of placebo, yeah. and whether there are any groups that are at particular vulnerable risk for complications. Mm -hmm. Most vaccines turn out to be safe in almost everybody that they're given to. The one exception is that if you've got an already impaired immune system and one in 100,000 people are born with a significantly impaired immune system, then you're not likely to want to get a live vaccine because the live vaccine might actually cause the disease you're trying to prevent if your immune system can't respond to the vaccine. Yeah. And so how long does that generally take? Is that a, a long process? That's obviously an expensive process. Yeah, on average 20 years from the time when you years. start thinking about the vaccine to the point where it's actually out there as a product. Wow. But the trials, for example, for the papillomavirus vaccine took somewhere about five years before they could reach a conclusion that the vaccine worked. And that was after you'd done all the preliminary trials. So it was just when you actually were trying to prove it actually worked. Right. Wow. Now, we're in week nine of this course, uh, so there are a lot of people in the course probably who've made it to this point who probably aren't uh, anti-vaccination types, mm -hmm. I think, and so they're probably thinking about this fairly critically and uh, they might be fairly willing to just dismiss the claims of anti-vaccination groups and so on just outright or call people silly or fanatical. What we're trying to do in this course is to prevent them from doing that, to get them to think why people might believe in these sorts of things. Do you have any thoughts about, about what drives people who don't want to vaccinate their children? Well, one very simple uh, consideration is that if we don't have any polio in this country, and we don't in Australia, we haven't had polio in this country for many years, mm -hmm. then why should my child have a vaccine to protect them against a disease which doesn't exist in this country? Mm -hmm. uh, after all, the vaccine has a very slight risk associated with it, and there is no risk of the disease. What people, of course, forget is that their children, when they grow up, are likely to go off to parts of the world where the infection still does exist, sure. and it's a bit late to get the vaccine after you've already got the infection. So that's one reason. It's the sort of, well, it's not really a problem anymore. Uh, in the old days, people used to rush to get vaccines. The polio vaccine was fought for when it first became available in the 1950s in the United States because there was an epidemic of polio every second year and people died yeah. and people became paralyzed and everybody knew what polio was. But now the next generation of mothers and fathers don't actually see polio anymore, so they don't see a risk. Sure. There's a second group that say, okay, well, if everybody else is vaccinated, I don't need to get my kid vaccinated. Yeah. And of course, that's quite correct because 
if there's no way of the infection spreading. For example, if everybody's vaccinated against measles except me, I'm fine. Yeah. Uh, but what they forget is that if only 99 out of every 100 people are vaccinated against measles, that's still enough to allow an epidemic to occur because every one person that gets infected will infect potentially 100 others. And if 99 are protected, they won't get it, but the other one will and will pass the infection on. So all the people who are not immunized will be at risk. Right. So that, that's a second reason, which is not a particularly good one, but you can understand why people think that, mm -hmm. especially for infections which are not as infectious as measles. Measles is incredibly infectious, but most infections are not that infectious. Yeah. The third reason why people think that is that they've listened to somebody who's had supposedly an adverse reaction to a vaccine. Mm -hmm. you know, they're persuaded by their neighbor saying, when my little kid got it, then he had convulsions afterwards. Yeah. Now, that's a rare complication of the measles vaccine, for example. Extreme, quite often the febrile convulsions turn out to be occurring with or without the vaccine. But the story gets around and, and Mrs. Yeah. Smith's daughter got into real trouble after vaccination and wouldn't it be better just not to be vaccinated? Right. Uh, those people are persuaded very rapidly when an epidemic of the infection occurs, for example, with the whooping cough and epidemics we've had recently, mm -hmm. that their, ki their kids really ought to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. But it takes the infection to do it. And then there's a small group of people who basically just have a set of disbeliefs about how the world works. Uh, they don't believe in the infectious nature of disease, for example. They have an animistic approach to why people get disease. It's punishment from God or sure. it's against my religion or whatever. Yeah. And they they just have these fixed beliefs and by and large they stay fixed. Yeah, yeah. You've mentioned that one of the reasons that people uh, tend not to immunize their children is, like you said, there, there isn't polio in the country. Uh, but if there was, it would obviously, people would be flocking to, to be vaccinated. Can you paint a picture as to what some of these things look like, uh, polio and measles and so on, for people who aren't inclined? Yeah, measles is, in most people's mind dismissed as just a spotty skin disease. Mm. Uh, and for many people who get measles, that's all it is. But one in a thousand will get a serious internal complication and one in a hundred thousand will be left with major brain damage as a result of measles infection. Mm -hmm. So that uh, measles, if you the unlucky one, is not a trivial disease. And in fact, more people die worldwide of measles than of any other infection apart from diarrhe diarrheal disease. Mm. It's quite a significant problem particularly for young kids. Mm -hmm. Indeed, uh, that's why we push to get kids vaccinated as early as possible in the developing world, because the risk of measles killing you is greatest when you're between the ages of zero and two. Mm -hmm. uh, polio, well, ni for 99 people out of 100, polio is a diarrheal illness which goes away after a couple of days. But for one in 100 people, it leads to paralysis, maybe of a leg or an arm. If you're really unlucky, it paralyzes your vocal muscles. And of course, the paralysis is permanent because the nerves that work these muscles are destroyed by the virus. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why people used to end up on respirators for the whole of their lives, because they were basically left unable to breathe for themselves. Mm -hmm. Another vaccine that I've been involved with, of course, is the vaccine for cervical cancer. And again, the virus that causes the cancer for 98 people out of 100, it's a trivial infection. They never know they've had it. Yeah. But for the 2% two two of people that get persisting infection, they can go on and get a cancer which will kill them. Yeah. And if, it, if it's not detected early enough, it's a lethal infection. In fact, papillomavirus kills more people worldwide. A quarter of a million people worldwide die every year as a result of papillomavirus infection. Uh, so that's a very significant burden. It's the ninth commonest cause of infectious disease death. Wow. I was looking uh, online at some of the claims by anti-vaccination groups and one group in particular in the US uh, was looking at one of the, I think it was a cervical cancer vaccine that you developed and said that uh, people died as a result during the clinical trial. Uh, how would you respond to them? Yes, well, Judicial Watch have been pushing that story for a while. They, what they do is they take the data from the clinical trials and say there were deaths in the people that were immunized. There were also deaths in the people who received the placebo. Mm -hmm. These deaths were assessed by the clinicians who were running the trial as not in any way associated with the vaccine. People die, unfortunately, all the time. Mm -hmm. the, these vaccines were given to teenage and young women, yep. and teenage and young women occasionally commit suicide. 
they occasionally are involved in lethal car accidents, mm -hmm. and they occasionally have other completely unrelated illnesses. And there was no difference between the placebo groups and the vaccine groups. So a judicial watch can reasonably claim that yes, there were deaths in the people who received the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And I would counter by saying yes, equally there were deaths in the people who received the placebo. And nobody thought that the deaths were connected with the vaccination process. Sure. Now, what sort of role does the media play? Um, which is tricky. I mean, it, we've been looking at a bunch of other issues in terms of climate change, in terms of uh, all sorts of claims that are made in the paranormal and everything else. Uh, does the media play a large role when it comes to anti-vaccination? Yeah, look, the media play a, a good role and sometimes a less good role. They, they get the story out there that a vaccine is available. Uh, the direct evidence of that is that we're doing research on a herpes vaccine at the moment mm -hmm. and there have been a bit of media coverage for that and that results in perhaps five to ten emails a day to me to say when will this herpes vaccine be available so obviously everybody is now aware that people are working on the vaccine for herpes on the other hand when somebody claims that they've had a bad reaction to the vaccine it's sensationalist stuff and the media cluster around and the story gains credence by the fact that more and more media get involved with it and the person responds appropriately to that by making their symptoms worse and worse and then of course the story goes global, uh, goes viral to use the current expression, although that's not <laughs> right for a vaccine I don't think. And the net result is of course that uh, the things get out of hand and what happened and as a consequence of that with the cervical cancer vaccine was that India cancelled its entire vaccination programme for the single cancer that kills more women than any other in India. You're kidding. Wow. Simply because there were four deaths which were attributable and the media picked up on it. The Hindu Times decided this was a political issue and that it went viral in India and eventually the government intervened and said that we can't have this much bad reaction even though there was no justification for it so they just cancelled the programmes. Mm -hmm. So what is the best counter? What's the best way I think to, that, that you can think of? I mean you've had a lot of, a lot of experience with uh, information campaigns and education, what do you think is the most effective to try to get as many people to, to immunize as possible, given the, in the face of this sort of uh, blatant disregard for the evidence? Well, there's two different approaches that are needed. In countries where the problem is common mm -hmm. and vaccines are there for being newly introduced to get rid of a problem, then simple word of mouth works extraordinarily well. Everybody knows somebody who's had the infection and if you come along and say we've got a vaccine and it's safe and particularly if that message comes from within the community, from the district nurses or health workers that are known to the people, the vaccine will be accepted and that's usually sufficient. In the developed world and particularly when you're introducing a new vaccine for something which people haven't really seen as a problem or don't think that they're at particular risk of, then there are are two important bits. One, one is that you start early with an education program before the vaccine becomes available. Mm -hmm. You get people used to the idea, let them ask the questions and make sure that you don't cover up stories that have been spreading around and make sure that everybody does get the information. But you produce booklets like this one which basically explain the facts behind the story as well in a way that people can understand. And again, word of mouth is important. If the doctor recommends it, if the district nurse recommends it, if the midwife recommends the vaccine, then the chances are the mother will accept it. Mm -hmm. And you've got to also accept that some people don't want to be vaccinated, mm -hmm. and that's their right. So you, don't, you never say, you must be vaccinated. You say, mm -hmm. you should be vaccinated because, yeah. and that's the best way to do it. Okay. Now, the, this is a question that we ask each of our guests uh, on uh, In Think 101. Uh, the title of the course is The Science of Everyday Thinking. Uh, given your career, given your experience uh, in, in vaccination and immunology and so on, what advice do you have for the students, the 60,000, 80,000 students who are taking the course, to improve their everyday thinking? I think that basically the more educated people are, the more likely they are to make correct decisions about things. You can never have too much education. Yeah. Even if, you know, if you're not going to be a scientist, if you're not going to go out there and do experiments, understanding the scientific process, the fact that you can make a hypothesis, or call it a guess if you like, and then test it, and then at the end of the testing be reasonably confident about whether your guess was correct or not, that is the basis for making decisions about things and that's the message that I would always leave people with. So that even if they don't do the experiments, 
they should be aware that when data are gathered through experimentation, it is actually testing an idea and it can be falsified. You can get an answer that says your hypothesis was wrong. The alternative is straight guesswork. Mm -hmm. You know, don't bother doing the experiment, let's just say I'm right, and then you get an answer. And that's not an uncommon approach to things, but it does lead to some very interesting mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I think that the important thing is to say that wherever possible, test the hypothesis. One of the issues that we're dealing with in the course is uh, the idea of cancer clusters. Uh, so these are quite common. We even had a case, I think, in 2006 in Brisbane. Um, have you had much experience? Do you know the phenomenon or, or why they tend to pop up? When I sat on the International Agency for Cancer Research's Scientific Advisory Board for a few years, this was one of the topics that used to come up regularly. It related to use of mobile phones, it related to stuff being discharged from factories. Some cancer clusters are very real. Mm -hmm. uh, environmental pollutants can produce a cancer cluster and sometimes those cancer clusters are the first evidence of the particular chemical that can cause a cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, Minimato disease for example is an example where toxic pollution produced a whole swathe of cancers and then the Bhopal disaster as well where there was a release of meth methyl cyanide I think it was into the environment and that produced a whole cluster of cancers. But most of the clusters that people are worried about, that mobile phone tower, this particular power station, they, there are half a dozen cancers or ten cancers in the community and somebody says that's a cluster. What they forget is that rare events occur rarely, but they do occur. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a population of seven billion and you're, on, you're sensitized to looking for clusters, you'll find them. Mm -hmm. And you'll find them with just the prob probability that you would expect if it's all random. Mm -hmm. In other words, a statistical analysis, plus a close look to see if it really is a cluster, because quite commonly what you find is they say, well, we've got six cancers, but it turns out that they're all quite different and they're not really a cluster of anything. Mm -hmm. They're just six people who were unfortunate to get a disease. Mm -hmm. So that uh, it's, it's partly statistics and partly common sense, but you just have to remember that people do get struck by lightning every now and then, and cancer clusters are in the sort of struck by lightning or one in a million chance, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. My name is Ian. I think about infections. Mm -hmm.